Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Nick Elliott, and along with my co-counsel, Zach Ryan, I represent the respondent in this matter, Mr. Dale Gribble. My co-counsel will show that Mr. Gribble's 14th Amendment claim, 14th, the, that the 14th Circuit ruling on Mr. Gribble's 14th Amendment claim should be affirmed because while in police custody, Mr. Gribble had a sufficiently serious medical need that Officer Wilson was aware of, but chose to ignore. I will show that the 14th Circuit ruling on Mr. Gribble's First Amendment claim should be affirmed because Ordinance 902 is an unconstitutional restriction on free speech. It does not pass the reasonableness test set out in O'Brien and later cases because one, it is content-based, two, it is not narrowly tailored to further a significant government interest, and three, it does not leave open ample alternative means of communication. Your Honors, the specific question in this case is whether Ordinance 902, an ordinance that establishes a nighttime curfew and broadly bans the symbolic erection of tents anywhere in Central Park, whether such an ordinance is an unconstitutional restriction on free speech. It, Counsel, before more you get this, started, sorry, just go ahead. <laughs> before you get started, threshold question. Whose burden of proof is it in this context, First Amendment? I mean, this is a strict scrutiny case, yes? So it, who's, whose burden is it? Your Honor, if, if it were deemed, if, if this court were to find that the, that the ordinance was content-based, it would be strict, strict scrutiny. However, if the court were to find that it was content-neutral, it would be intermediate scrutiny. If it was strict scrutiny, it would be on the government, the government would have the burden of proof of, of, saying, of proving that they had a compelling government interest in, in passing the ordinance and that it was the least restrictive means we're, available. You, we're to understand that it's your burden, is what if, you're arguing. If, no, Your Honor. If, if, it, if, the regu if the ordinance is content-based, it would be the city's burden to prove that it, they had a compelling interest. However, if this court were to find that it's content-neutral, we would have the burden in this okay. case. Would you uh, separate out two matters uh, as you proceed? Simply being in the park at night and the cessation of uh, power and Wi-Fi service. And I would very much like to hear your views on why should the city pay for power and Wi-Fi service? Your Honor, uh, it's not our position that the city should necessarily pay for Wi-Fi and power service. However, if they are going to provide the service, which they have provided the service, um, they should provide that service equally to everyone and not cut it off based on a certain speaker's yes, message. So they elected not to provide the service at night. That's true, Your Is Honor. Is it constitutionally obliged for the city to provide Wi-Fi service in a park at night? No, no, Your Honor, it's not. They don't have to. They do not have to provide Wi-Fi service in the park at night. However, if they had been providing Wi-Fi service apparently at night before um, before it was cut off in this instance. So to arbitrarily cut it off just based on this Occupy Garner's protest, uh, that seems arbitrary. Well, the 14th Circuit seemed to rely on that aspect in finding that an impermissible burden on speech is a part of the ordinance and the reason they struck the ordinance down, correct? Correct, Your Honor. Where in the ordinance does it say anything about electricity and Wi-Fi? Your Honor, the ordinance does not say anything about electricity or Wi-Fi. Is this another 14th Circuit decision that we can just ignore? Your Honor, we, we, it's not, we believe that since the city had already been providing electricity and, and Wi-Fi that they should have continued to provide it because it would be arbitrary and uh, discriminatory to just cut it off based on Occupy Garner's protest. However, the reason that the primary reason that we believe that this statute um, did not leave open ample alternative means of communication is not because the the city cut off Wi-Fi. Rather, it was because the the erection of symbolic tents and the 24-hour presence is critical to the occupier's message. And Ordinance 902 does ban symbolic tents anywhere in the park. So your the members of your group could have gone across the street to Denny's after the park was closed, hooked up on the internet, and continued to provide their message to the public. Sure, Your Honor. So now, that's, a, that's an alternate means that seems readily available. Yes, Your Honor. And How during I, the day, they can erect their tents and provide their visual message to the public. No, Your Honor. During the day, they are not allowed to erect their tents. If you read the ordinance, it says that recreational camping, it, that camping or erecting tents is limited to the specified RV area, and then it's only allowed for recreational camping purposes. Well, now, that, the, the ordinance, as I read it, addresses recreational camping and confines that to the RV area. It doesn't say anything about prohibiting tents in the non-RV area during daylight hours. Your Honor, it says that there could be no erection of tents or camping except for in the RV area. And it also says that that has to be for recreational purposes. Now, the primary purpose of, this, of Occupy's protest is not recreational camping. The reason they're erecting these tents 
is because their primary purpose is to speak. So because their primary purpose is to speak, they would not be considered recreational campers in this instance, and therefore Ordinance 902 does preclude them from erecting their tents in the park. And the primary purpose needs 24 hours a day, correct? Their primary purpose, uh, yes, they're, they're occupying. Their, their, their purpose is to be in the park 24-7, um, to erect their symbolic tents in the park, uh, to convey their message most effectively. All right, let's get down to that. What is your client's message? Let's focus on what the symbolism is supposed to mean to me. What's, what are we to believe the symbolic message is that is constitutionally permissible? I mean, some would say, the symbolism is to shut capitalism down completely. Your Honor, Some would say, I mean, help me with what is the focus of your client? Your Honor, the Occupy Movement does have a very broad message, but it, overall the message, the message is clearly that, that there is ever-growing economic and political inequality in this country, and that's what they wish to bring attention to through their protests. Now, the way that's conveyed to others is the occupiers erect their symbolic tents and if you notice, the, the occupiers do erect their tents in central economic areas, downtown Gardner, just, just across the street from the state capitol. And I think it's safe to assume that it's just across the street from bank buildings and other corporate offices that but would aren't be... aren't those all closed night? So what's the purpose of violating the ordinance by staying there past 9 o'clock? Your Honor, the banks may be closed at night, but they're not specifically just talking to the banks. They're speaking to everyone. And the 24-hour presence um, makes, their, makes their message much more powerful. Well, who was downtown after 9 o'clock? <laughs> Your Honor, I, I wouldn't want to speculate on who would be downtown after 9 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> uh, it, is, it, makes their, it, makes their, it makes their message much more powerful to have that 24-hour presence so that the policymakers and the people in the banks, the people in the corporate office know these people mean business. They're not going anywhere. They really want to see change happen. And whenever you see their humble tents juxtaposed against bank buildings and the state capitol, these lavish corporate offices, that really makes their message clear. It's very powerful symbolic speech, and it's not powerful like that anywhere else in the city. There's nowhere else in the well, city. Is it more powerful at night than in the day after 9 o'clock? Why is it? What's the difference? I mean, why does it have to be there after 9 o'clock? When nobody's there to see it. You know, there may be sleeps. someone there to see it. However, it's just, it, it is the, it's the, it's the, it's a power, it's more powerful message when they're 24-7 just because everyone knows that these people really want to see results and they're dedicated to their cause. It's only a powerful message if you have a receiver of that message. And in downtown, if nobody's down there to receive it, what's the purpose? Well, Your Honor, just because may, there may be no one downtown to see it, that doesn't mean that these people should not be allowed to speak. I don't think that this court has ever held that just because no one was around to, to hear the speech that it should be limited or completely banned. Um, Council, and I think I'd, that's, a, that's important. You know. I'd like you to address um, a couple of the cases that uh, address this expressive conduct. Um, you've got Clark versus Community for Creative Nonviolence, the uh, Washington, uh, the National uh, Mall case. Uh, how does how your case <coughs> stack up with that? And then Texas versus Johnson. What, what's the difference between those? Your Honor, in Clark, the Washington, D.C. had an ordinance or a statute that banned sleeping in Lafayette Park and on the mall. Now, the protesters in Clark were still allowed to erect symbolic tents. However, the court drew the line, drew a line, and the city drew a line between erecting tents and sleeping because whenever they, they drew the line at sleeping because once protesters or people began sleeping in the park, they determined that that was using the park as a living accommodation. Now, obviously, certain issues are, are, arise whenever someone uses the park as a living condition, and that's why the city was routinely asking homeless persons who were sleeping in the park to leave, the city of Shawnee, that is. However, th there's nothing in the record that indicates that the city of Shawnee was asking you know, a jogger or someone who was just standing around the park asking them to leave. How about Texas versus Johnson? Your Honor, in that case, uh, I, you know, I, I believe it's the symbolic, it, it involves symbolic expression similar to, similar to um, what the, what the protesters, protesters uh, wish, wish to convey. Well, what kind of action was involved in Johnson? Your Honor, I believe it was a burning of a U.S. flag, if I'm not mistaken. And so if we're talking about expression, uh, burning a flag, uh, being in a public place and expressing your views about something uh, through your expressive action, do you see any difference between those two? 
No, Your Honor, because the reason that burning a flag is symbolic speech is because the actor has a specific message that they want to convey, and also that message is likely to be understood by others. And what was the decision as it pertained to the two cases? Do you, do you know what happened in the two cases? Yes, Your Honor. The, the Supreme Court upheld the D.C. The DC ordinance that banned li using the park as a living accommodation, and it also upheld the ability of, of protesters to burn a flag. Now, the occupiers have a specific message that they wish to convey, that there's ever-growing political and economic inequality in America. Well, counsel, is, is counsel for the city correct that there were no Occupy protesters arrested who were erecting tents or hooking up RVs in the designated camping area of this park? Your Honor, the record doesn't reflect if they were arrested for that purpose. Um, however, just because they weren't arrested for erecting the tents does not mean that the ordinance doesn't effectively ban it. I think in... How does the ordinance ban their expressive speech or expressive conduct if it's confined to the designated camping area? It, it, the, the expressive conduct is not even allowed in the, in the camping area because it's not recreational camping. Um, so if, if the city had enacted an ordinance that would still allow the protesters to be in that limited RV area, uh, overnight and erect their symbolic tents, perhaps we wouldn't be here today. But that's we not... know what recreational camping is? Your Honor, recreational camping would seem to be camping that you're just doing for fun, that this is, you know... The justice's premise is that there were no arrests over in that RV camping area, right? Yes, not to my knowledge, not to our knowledge, Your Honor. There, right, there... Well, what is the policeman supposed to go, uh, tent by tent over there and say, are you having fun? <laughs> Well, Your Honor, I, I don't know, and that would be a good question for the city because the city is, is the one who chose to, to, to segregate, to make a difference between recreational camping and, uh, and symbolic speech. Um, didn't so, your client choose to violate the ordinance by staying past 9 o'clock? Didn't he choose to violate the ordinance by staying when the electricity and the Wi-Fi was turned off? Didn't he choose to violate an order of an officer to leave? Therefore, is he not a provocateur who brought this on himself? Your Honor, he did choose, he did choose, the protesters in general did choose to stay in the park after its closing. I mean, they're practicing civil disobedience, which has been a practice that has been, uh, that, that many people have practiced civil disobedience in, in our country have, uh, have been deemed heroes. Um, so to, to label Mr. Gribble and, and his, and his uh, fellow protesters, to label them as instigators, um, I think is probably the wrong word, but certainly they're political activists and certainly they were participating in civil disobedience. Um, and that's something that's been cherished in this country for a long time. What on the if question they had been of ignored? If they, what if they were, and they were just there? I mean, I think that goes back to who's downtown in the evening, but I mean, if, if there's not someone there who's, they can be antagonistic against, um, it seems like their whole message fails. No, Your Honor, I mean, because there doesn't necessarily, suppose for instance that there were some protesters that um, were, were not, not able to protest or communicate their message effectively. They're, they're inept, let's just say. Now, I can't imagine that this court would, would hold that those inept protesters, simply because they're not able to convey their message very clearly, that they should not be allowed to speak. And I think that's similar to this situation. Just because there's no one downtown doesn't mean that the Occupy Gardner protesters shouldn't have a right to speak at night. Um, and I think there still is an issue that pe some people may be downtown at night. But people you would agree that, that we've got to determine that there's a likelihood that this message would be understood by somebody. I mean, that is an element coming from, I think, Johnson, the Johnson case and the Spence case. Mm -hmm. That's a requirement, is it not? It's a requirement that I mean, the message... It, it, you know, after 9 o'clock would be received by someone and clearly understood. The, the requirement in Spence was that the message would be likely to be understood by others. Okay. Like, yeah, it's kind of like the tree falling in the forest and no one's there to hear it. Does it make a noise? <laughs> yes, Your Honor, because just because there aren't people there to listen, they, these protesters still have a right to, to exercise their First Amendment rights. And even if they were inept, if they couldn't communicate their message effectively, they would still have that right. And this court should not hold that just because someone would possibly not be in the park at nighttime that they shouldn't be um, that they should be not allowed to speak. It's the totality of their presence. That totality, that overnight presence, even speaks during the daytime. Does that go to your argument about cutting off the electricity and Wi-Fi access? No, Your Honor, that's simply an issue of that the city was already providing these services and it was arbitrary for them to cut them off once they were already providing Was that a mechanism them. for the protesters to convey their message uh, regardless of who was there after hours in the downtown city area to see or hear that message? Yes, Your Honor. 
Is it possible? So I understand your argument about what that, that sleeping in the park is is part and parcel and is key to this symbolic speech. Is it possible that you would have a, a, a regulation that was legitimate that didn't violate the Constitution, but then because of the way an organization defines what are the components of its speech, it could then become constitutionally invalid? Yes, Your Honor, I'm out of time. May I briefly respond? Answer the question. Uh, Your Honor, the I'm not sure I completely understood what, what the point you're making. Uh, could you? The, the concern was is that that somehow you could you could characterize the, the nature of the speech in such a way that 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 itself would then take an otherwise constitutional standard, an otherwise constitutional regulation, and make it unconstitutional because a particular group would say that a key to their symbolic speech is the very nature of the activity. Yes, Your Honor, I think that's fair. Thank you.